It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Luis O. Silva. Professor Luis O. Silva is a highly accomplished academic and researcher who currently holds the position of distinguished professor at the Instituto Superior Técnico University of Lisbon. Additionally, he serves as a visiting professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Oxford. His academic journey includes the acquisition of various degrees, including licentiate in 1992, a PhD in 1997, and a habilitation in 2005, or earned at Instituto Superior Técnico. Professor Silva conducted research as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Los Angeles, from 1977 to 2001. His research expertise centers on the in silico exploration of the interaction between intense beams of particles and laser with plasma. He combined theoretical physics with advanced numerical simulation, particularly using massively parallel computing to investigate this interaction in both laboratory and astrophysical settings. Professor Silva's exceptional contribution to the field has been recognized through numerous national and international awards and honors. Notably, he has received two European Research Council advanced grants and prestigious recognition in the academic and research world. Furthermore, his accomplishment has led to his election as fellow of STEMET organization, including the American Physical Society, the European Physical Society, and the European Academy of Science. He has also been honored as a corresponding member of the Lisbon Academy of Science, solidifying his status as a distinguished science, scientist and scholar. On behalf of all Rio's members, I will call you, Professor, to this webinar. Kindly request Professor Luis O. Silva to begin the presentation. Um, so, so thank you, thank you so much for the for the for the invitation and for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the physics uh, that many groups worldwide are exploring using ultra intense lasers. So this is a, a different regime of physics, and I will try to guide you through uh, what what are the new uh, regimes that one can explore by using ultra intense lasers, and what is the new physics, and what are the exciting de developments. So let me first start by acknowledging my collaborators in my team uh, at, uh, at at IST, and also collaborates at the University of California, Los Angeles, at uh, the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. University of Colorado, Princeton University, and uh, Oxford University. And most in most of my presentation, I'm going to show uh, results that have been obtained with numerical simulations. And these simulations have been performed in some of the largest supercomputers in, in Europe and in the world. And I would also like to acknowledge the, the support for, for these high performance computing institutions. So I will uh, I will first uh, I will first give you a little bit motivation for why are we talking about uh, extreme physics? Uh, the no the Nobel Prize winner of, of twenty eighteen, uh, Professor Gerard Mou, published uh, a paper um, about twenty years ago in Scientific American where he introduced the term extreme light. Uh, and extreme light is associated with his discovery of uh, his invention of chirp pulse amplification that I will. I will briefly explain in the in the in the next slide, and this has triggered significant uh, interest in the scientific community, and uh, this is highlighted by a report that was prepared by the National Academy of Science in the U.S., which is called "Frontiers in High Energy Density Physics," or the X Games of Contemporary Science, where all the opportunities associated with these extreme light intensities and their connection with other fields come are are, are highlighted. So what has been really dri driving uh, these uh, these advances uh, is this turning point here on CPA, called CPA. Okay. So on this plot, I'm showing the focused laser intensity as a function of the year. And we see the evolution right from the invention of the laser in 1960. We see a rapid increase, but then for almost 30 years, we have a flattening on the intensity. Uh, um, after, after, of course, the advance is associated with quick Q switching and mode locking. And then suddenly in late 90, uh, 1980s, 
Gerard Monroux and Donna Strickland invented the, the chirp pulse amplification, and this has led to an explosion in, in laser intensity as highlighted here on this, on this plot. On this chirp pulse amplification, instead of amplifying the laser, uh, very short laser pulse as it is, the pulse is first stretched uh, in a very uh, uh, in, in a very well defined way, stretched such that the pulse length is is increased. Then then the pulse is amplified and then it's compressed back. And through this through this technique, through this chirp pulse amplification, it's possible to increase the intensity of the lasers to to these very uh, very high intensities that we are seeing here. This plot also shows that as we increase the intensity, the physics that we can probe by the motion of the electrons or even the ions on on the laser field is is changing. So if he, if for low for low laser intensities we are still in regimes where we are dealing with atomic uh, or molecular laser physics, at some point uh, we are exciting the bound electrons, and if the intensity goes up, uh, we start to uh, strip the atoms from all the electrons and actually uh, drive, creating creating ionized gas or a plasma that then has different uh, uh, dynamics. Of course, if, if we continue to go up in intensity, the quiver motion of the electrons on the laser field starts to be relativistic. And this brings exciting, exciting physics, as I, I will try to show. And if we keep increasing the laser intensity, we start to, to go into regimes where not only the ions start to be relativistic, quivering with relativistic velocities, but also we can start to probe the properties of the vacuum. Uh, quantum electrodynamic processes start to play a role, and we observe a transition from classical electrodynamics to quantum electrodynamics. What is exciting is that these days in, there are many uh, lasers in the world and several projects worldwide that are starting to probe uh, this transition. And I will, I will try to explain you why this is very exciting. So what is the re regime that we call extreme plasma physics? There's a nice, a nice report that was prepared uh, a few years ago by a number of scientists that essentially describes this regime, this extreme physics regime or extreme plasma physics regime as plasma physics, so the, the collective dynamics of electrons ions, but supplemented by several additional physical effects. Many of them go beyond uh, traditional plasma physics or classical electrodynamics. And these effects include special relativity, because we are generating relativistically hot plasmas, so temperatures higher than MeV, and relativistic bulk, bulk motion, so gamma factors of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of our medium that can be uh, a few to hundreds. Radiation reaction effects, uh, we are in conditions where the particles are accelerated with such, such strong, uh, strong acceleration that their radiation uh, is, is sufficiently strong that the emitted photons actually have an impact on the dynamics of the photons of the electrons, electron positron pair creation, ultra, ultra strong magnetic fields, so strong that QED, such, such a QED effects such as one photon pair creation plays, uh, plays an important role, um, and even in some cases general relativistic effects. All this is, is opening exciting frontiers, both in ultra intense laser and particle beams and relativistic astrophysics, uh, and I will focus a little bit on on the uh, on the ultra intense laser physics that that we are uncovering in these in, in these regimes and slightly mention the relativistic relativistic astrophysics so what are the questions that uh, the, the scientific community is trying to answer uh, what are the frontier questions so the first question is what is the behavior of matter in vacuum at the intensity frontier so intensities on the order of 10 to the 23 watts per square centimeter in laboratory in astrophysics. And the second question is, can we understand and explore this complex and nonlinear behavior with a combination of simulations, theory, and experiments with lasers and beams? So this is kind of the overarching questions that many groups are trying to address. And this is the, the big question that uh, my team has been trying to understand for the past, uh, for the past uh, 20 years. 
uh, to to address to address these uh, uh, these points, one of the key tools, one of the key methodologies, are what we call particle in cell simulations. These are simulations that uh, essentially follow charged particles under the action of uh, of uh, of uh, electric and magnetic fields, and they are some some of the most sophisticated uh, simulations. These kinetic particle in cell simulations are some of the most sophisticated simulations that one one can perform in plasma physics and it's possible to supplement these simulations with with quantum electrodynamics effects that play play uh, play critical role so this has been a, a critical tool for all the advances that i'm going to show you and so essentially we'll be following looking at the the motion of particles represented here with these uh, uh, circles in red and blue uh, moving on a grid, and we saw Maxwell's equations on, on, on the grid using as a source term for the electric and magnetic field advance, the currents that are generated by these particles as they move around. These days, these simulations can run on the largest supercomputers in the world. In some cases, it's possible to do one-to-one -one simulations for instance, of plasma-based accelerators. Uh, and by this, I mean using on the simulation as many particles there as there are in the real system. And so it's possible to to study and to explore uh, a wide range of uh, physical scenarios and this is a critical component when studying the extreme physics driven by intense light uh, these are very sophisticated codes but actually I, I, I invite you to also explore this VPIC educational code suite which has many many examples of uh, and this can be run uh, as, a, as a student uh, uh, student type of uh, project uh, where uh, where some some of these concepts can 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 be studied and this is a uh, fully available for for everyone to use this zipic educational code suite with many examples of that that uh, uh, students and researchers alike can 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 explore uh, what i'm going to show you are results obtained with a particular particle in cell code which is called osiris this is a joint collaboration between, between ucla and technical uh, in lisbon and and this is a truly a state-of-the-art code that runs on uh, on machines that range from a laptop to a massively parallel uh, uh, machines what, what what is interesting is that these peak codes they have been around for many years so the, their invention is due to uh, john dawson and oscar Bunneman in the 60s at, uh, at the university of princeton at stanford university uh, but since then there have been many advances and in the past uh, in, in the past 10 10 uh, 15 years uh, there's been a strong push to complement these uh, simulation methods that are essentially classical by the inclusion of uh, QED, quantum electrodynamic processes. So the, the first steps were, were taken by John Kirk and Tony Bell and, and, uh, and their, their student, uh, where they, they've uh, looked at, uh, they couple these particle and cell simulations with Monte Carlo simulations. And then uh, other researchers uh, started to use, uh, to use these particle and cell simulations coupled with QED modules to look at cascades that I will show a few examples. And uh, uh, right after that, it started to be possible to study uh, ultra-intense laser fields interacting directly with solid targets. So this is very exciting because this is showing us that there are many possible uh, uh, experiments to be done, many physical scenarios to explore, and very exciting physics uh, to, to discover. Let me just... Uh, if if you want a little bit more details on how these particle in cell codes work we just have our particles moving on a grid they are pushed due to the Lorentz force and then we complement the Lorentz force with with uh, some uh, with some probabilistic calculation that takes takes into account uh, the 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 probability of emission of additional particles and these particles that can be emitted can be either photons or electron positron pairs and if we are uh, dealing with charged particles, they will deposit their current on the grid, this current J, and this current J is then the source to advance the electric field and magnetic field according to Maxwell's equations. And then after advancing E and B, we can interpolate the force back into the particles and then continue, continue this loop. 
So at the most fundamental level, the, the only approximations that, uh, that these, this numerical model deals with is the fact that we are uh, discretizing the fields on, on a grid. Uh, apart from that, very few approximations are, are, are involved in our, in our description. What is interesting is that with the laser intensities that we now start to see uh, in the labs, we are truly on the on uh, truly close to the frontier where we will see the emergence of relativistic quantum behavior with intense fields. So there's a there's a quantity that allows us to quantify this, which is called the Schwinger field, and this is essentially the electric field for which there is vacuum breakdown. So if we have a static electric field with this value. There's a probability which starts to be significant of generating uh, an electron and a positron a positron pair from from vacuum. So we can define a quantity which is called chi that is going to show a few times in our in my presentation, which is the ratio of the electric field over the Schwinger field. What is exciting uh, in many of the of the experimental facilities is that uh, this chi. Uh, this electric field is, of course, extremely high, and we don't have yet lasers that achieve this electric field. But if we take into account that this, this quantity uh, can be generalized for any Lorentz frame, uh, it's, it's, it's clear right away that uh, if we have relativistic particles in a way that the gamma factor uh, of our particles, if we have relativistic flows and the gamma is high enough, then the gamma multiplied by the electric field that these particles are feeling can be comparable to the Schwinger field. And so we are really on the verge of, uh, of uh, performing experiments on this transition where chi starts to be, this quantity starts to be comparable to one and where we will have relativistic quantum behavior in the presence of intense fields. So this is very, very exciting. But of course, as you all know, there are a number of uh, quantum electrodynamic processes that one needs to take into account. Uh, Bram Strahlung, Betty Heitler, Trident, Coulomb, or nonlinear Compton, nonlinear Bright Wheeler, Trident electromagnetic. And so this is a whole new uh, regime, uh, set, uh, whole new parameter space the, for, uh, for, um, for us to explore using this combination of um, Ultra intense fields interacting with with matter. So this is really really exciting, and this is a, a frontier both from the theoretical side, the computational side, and the experimental side. So what are what are the big questions that people are addressing when looking at ultra intense laser and particle beams, and at this intensity frontier? So as I as I've shown before, this is this is the landscape. At this moment, the, the, the available lasers are here on this transition, 10 to the 23, 10 to the 24 watts per square centimeter. There, there are lasers planned, uh, lasers in Europe, the extreme light infrastructure. There's a laser system uh, planned in, in China called uh, SULF, uh, which is going to be a 25 petawatt laser system. There is a laser system uh, few petawatt laser system planned for for the us and another two times 25 petawatt uh, planned for uh, the university of rochester also in the us and so there's there lots of excitement uh, around the, the construction and the development of these lasers in europe the the flagship lasers are the ones under the extreme light infrastructure but there's also uh, a strong push at the uh, at the uh, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory with the EPAC and uh, the upgrade of the Vulcan laser, and also in France there are plans for uh, for multi petawatt uh, laser developments that can achieve this type of this type of intensities. So this is very exciting. There are lasers, there are supercomputers, and there are theoretical developments. So there's a, a very nice combination of uh, of methodologies and tools that can help us uh, drive this, this exciting frontier forward. Let me just uh, state that these, these, light in, these, uh, these electromagnetic intensities are also present in particle beams. So if you look at the LHC at CERN, uh, the intensity that uh, associated with the beam is 2.5 10 to the 19 watts per square centimeter. The SPS at CERN, 1.5 10 to the 18. 
The ILC is predicted to achieve 1.5 10 to the 24, and SLAC uh, in Stanford 1.2 10 to the 19 watts per square centimeter. So there's exciting physics, not only on the lasers, but also on the beams, and they, they share several several common features. And it's really exciting to be able to uh, explore these different uh, uh, the, these different sources, but with with uh, with uh, with different uh, beams. So this is really really exciting. Pl plasma accelerators are are clearly an example of extreme plasma physics, extreme physics at the forefront of science. This is a, a clear example where simulations combined with lasers, combined with sources, directly impacted this, this, this progress. This is just a sample of all the, the, the big scientific results that have been obtained over the years by many teams uh, around the world, including, in, including uh, my team. And to understand the, the, the fundamental physics, I always like to show this, this movie from a former uh, PhD student at Technico. And uh, this is a movie that shows an, a very intense laser propagating through a plasma. And as it propagates through a plasma, which is, which is a combination of electrons and, uh, and ions, what you see is that uh, the radiation pressure of the laser pushes the electrons out. And so there's an ion column that is formed in the back of the laser. This ion column sustains an electric field that pulls back the electrons into the axis. The, the, the nonlinear response of the plasma is so strong that you drive a, a, a bubble or a wake, in the, and in the back of this bubble, there's wave breaking. And so we, this very, uh, very well-known uh, nonlinear phenomena associated with any, any wave system, uh, and so you have wave breaking, and on the back of this bubble, you see particles that are injected into the bubble. And since we have a ion channel in this region, uh, we have a, a, an electric field that focuses the electrons, but also accelerates the electrons in the longitudinal direction. This was an idea that was first proposed by John Dawson and Toshi Tajima at UCLA, and this is kind of the fundamental idea for laser plasma laser plasma accelerators. As you see here. Uh, the the electrons are gaining energy uh, because their color is is changing. They start here at zero because they are at rest. The laser is moving towards them, and then they are injected into the bubble, and their energy goes up. They are quickly becoming relativistic, and since we have relativistic electrons that have a, a transverse acceleration, that they are going to radiate. And so one of the most exciting applications of laser plasma acceleration is what we call Betatron X-ray imaging. So these, uh, these relativistic electrodes, they generate X-rays, and these X-rays have been used to make uh, high contrast images of many samples. They, they go from uh, breast, uh, uh, human, human breast uh, samples to mouse embryos to to materials and to shocks. So this is really exciting because now we have a source of X-rays that is significantly cheaper than, uh, than a synchrotron, but it has properties in terms of contrast and in terms of energy that, that are truly, truly unique. So this is one of the most exciting directions. The other, the other exciting direction is the ability to use these electron beams to generate secondary particles. So not only X-rays, but also electrons and positrons. This is an example of, uh, of, of, these, uh, of these results. The laser is shot through the gas, and it ionizes the gas, it generates a wake, and it generates these electron beams, and these electrons are then sent through a solid target, and from the interaction of the electrons with the solid target, you generate a shower of electrons and positrons playing with the thickness of the solid target and then with the selection process, it's possible to generate uh, what we call a fireball, so a neutral, quasi-neutral cloud of electrons and positrons that can then be used to probe some fundamental plasma physics of relevance for astrophysical scenarios. Let me just point out that we are also involved in an experiment at CERN that has the aim of generating even denser pair beams and again, we are using a very high intensity beam. In this case, this is a proton beam at 400 GeV per, uh, per proton uh, that is sent through a converter that generates, uh, that generates a shower of particles. And then through a selection process, this shower of particles uh, is, uh, is 
we have a, a selection of a shower, a cloud of electrons and positrons that then is sent through a plasma cell. What, what we know from, uh, from simulations, uh, like the ones presented here, is that these, these uh, showers of electrons and positrons will filament through, through a current filamentation instability. And this is one, uh, and this is uh, this instability called the current filamentation instability or the Weibull instabilities, is thought to be one of the ingredients to understand how magnetic fields are generated in some astrophysical scenarios like gamma ray bursts and relativistic shocks. So we have a very nice, a very nice and exciting tool to generate these unique uh, uh, plasmas, electron-positron plasmas, quasi-neutral electron-positron plasmas that allow us to mimic in the laboratory some of these extreme uh, astrophysical conditions. What is more interesting is that as we increase the intensity, we start to have access to even more exciting uh, uh, physics and one of the frontiers is is the the possibility to study radiation reaction configurations so i've shown you just now that if we send the ultra intense laser through a plasma uh, it will generate uh, this bubble and on the back of the bubble we are going to have high energy electrons okay now let's imagine that we have a second laser again at very high intensities 10 to the 21 watts per square centimeter all the lasers that i'm talking about at the the wavelength it's at 800 nanometers so near near infrared and then we collide this laser with the electrons here on the back right if the intensity of this laser is high enough and if these electrons are have a very high gamma we are going to be in the conditions where this parameter chi starts to be comparable to one and the, the first consequence of this is that these electrons are going to be radiating synchrotron radiation very efficiently. The, this, this process is so efficient that the, the accelerated electrons are essentially going to lose a significant fraction of their initial kinetic energy into gamma rays. This allows us to study a very fundamental problem in, a, in classical electrodynamics, which is called radiation reaction. And uh, if you go to a classical uh, electrodynamics uh, textbook like Jackson, you'll see there's a chapter there about uh, radiation reaction, and you get one of the hardest uh, equations in physics where we have a third time derivative of the position with respect to time uh, associated precisely with uh, with radiation reaction. So understanding, um, if you if you go to Jackson and, and read that particular chapter on uh, on uh, on radiation reaction, you realize that there are uh, there are unphysical solutions to this equation. So one of the questions that uh, scientists have been trying to answer is uh, what happens on this transition from classical radiation reaction to quantum radiation reaction, and uh, what what are the models that we should use for classical radiation reaction that that allow for a smooth transition to quantum quantum electrodynamics. And these experiments and some and the simulations and the theory now allow us to to answer these uh, these questions. Uh, um, experiments have been trying to compare what happens in the classical regime with the QED regime by colliding these laser pulses. And what is interesting is that if we look at the uh, again referring to this previous slide, so we have a second laser and we have an electron beam here, and so. The different energies of the electron beams are represented by the different colors of these lines. So the blue 0.5 GeV electron beam, 1 GeV electron beam, and so on, up to 53 GeV electron beams. And then this is the intensity of the second laser pulse. What is, uh, there are two things that I would like to point out here. First, is that we can have a significant energy loss of the incoming electron beam, so at 10 to the 21 watts per square centimeter. Right? The, the electron beam, uh, 1.5 GeV electron beam, oops, sorry. 1.5 GeV electron beam will lose almost 50% of its initial energy when it collides with a laser pulse. This is one point, and the, and the, the same for 1 GeV, almost 40%. But more interesting is that if you look at these parameters, and these are parameters that start to be available, these intensities start to be available in the laboratory, we are already in a regime which is very close to this chi of one, which means that we are really probing the transition from classical electrodynamics to quantum quantum electrodynamics. There have been experiments uh, already to test uh, these ideas, uh, and 
and uh, there are many experiments uh, being done and these experiments are essentially uh, what I've described. So you have a laser, it interacts with a gas jet, generates an electron beam, and then you have a second uh, a second laser that that is made uh, is made uh, so it generates the electron beam, and then you have a second then you have a second laser that is made interact in counter propagation with the relativistic electron beam that is coming in, and then there is a, a, a detection system with some magnets and some uh, and some cameras to generate uh, both both the electrons and the gamma rays that are that are produced. The, the the experiments have not yet been conclusive. This is best illustrated here on these on these results here. Uh, where where the plots uh, the plots represent the on the vertical axis number of particles horizontal axis is the electron energy and so uh, in uh, in in black we have the curve for the electron beam without colliding with the with a uh, counter propagating laser pulse so this is the electron beam that's generated so you see uh, okay always the same features the peak is at energy which is uh, around 1.5 uh, GeVs, and then when it collides with the laser pulse, this is in red. You see that the the beam is slowed down, so it's it's losing a significant fraction of the energy. What is interesting here is that there, uh, these different uh, plots represent different models for the radiation reaction, and so you see you have perturbative Landauer Lifshitz, semi classical and full QED in peak simulations. And you see there's, there's still not yet uh, a good match. So there's, there's still significant, significant studies to understand, to understand this. There are recent experiments done in other labs where this comparison is way better. And uh, the reason for this discrepancy is that the intensity across a finite laser pulse is not, is not uniform because the pulse is Gaussian. And of course, this needs to be taken into account when doing the modeling. But recent results are are getting us to a point where we can look at the the spectra of the electron beams with and without colliding with the with the laser pulse, and actually understanding what is the physics uh, the physics at play. So this is very exciting. Of course, we can think about going to configurations where the intensity can be even higher. And there are plans to build these lasers. These lasers don't yet exist. And I, I like to show this movie because this movie is so simple, but yet it captures all the relevant physics. So I'm going to show you uh, what happens when we have an electron here, just one single electron, two electromagnetic waves. But the intensities of these electromagnetic waves are, are uh, in, in these normalized units, this is a thousand. So, so in the, in, uh, in, uh, more uh, more uh, more obvious uh, units this is uh, a laser pulse with intensity close to 10 to the 24 watts per square centimeter so this is this is the most possible uh, it's the, the simplest configuration you just have one electron you have two two laser beams coming coming at this coming at this electron so the electrons are uh, the electrons are in uh, in blue and as expected, when the, these very high intensity lasers come in, the electrons are quivering with such a strong acceleration, they start to generate photons. Then the photons themselves, they interact with the laser field because they are so high energy and the laser field is so intense. They, they themselves they generate positrons and electrons. And then you feed in more electrons and positrons that are quivering in the laser field that are generating. And so you have these cascades in counter-propagating electromagnetic fields. So even such a simplest scenario when we go to these intensities and when QED starts to play a role gets us to uh, unique physics regimes as we are seeing uh, right here. Uh, the, 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 what I've shown is a very simplified picture. It's a 2D. Uh, if we go to uh, 3D simulations, we see the, all the effects associated with the polarization play a role. And here, for instance, is two lasers with linear polarization, uh, double clockwise circularly polarized or clockwise anti-clockwise polarization. And as expected, uh, depending on the polarization, we get different uh, electron, positrons, and photon emissions. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that all these processes depend on this chi parameter. And this chi parameter 
uh, depends not only on the structure of the electric field and the B field, but also the, the momentum of the particles that are uh, quivering on these, uh, on these systems. So this is very exciting. This is one of the frontiers for this laser. There are many people trying to understand uh, these dynamics, these extreme physics in these ultra intensity fields. I'll, let, I'll, I'll just I'll just skip skip this slide just to uh, uh, I would just like to point out that one can conceive very much more uh, sophisticated uh, contributions, and my colleague Maria Branić has has studied in detail different possible configurations of crossing crossing beams. Uh, there's an ideal configuration that was explored in this paper here in physical review 2012, but there are more realistic configurations that can still lead us to very high uh, uh, intensities, uh, combined intensities such that this value of chi can be uh, maximized and the number of pairs or the gamma of photons can be can be optimized. Um, what one 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 interesting thing is that at some point the the plasma the electrons and the density of plasma that is generated when these two lasers collide starts to have a density that can become so high that it starts to reflect back the uh, the laser light so this is this is also very exciting because this is one truly example of the interplay between quantum electrodynamics and the laser physics so this is an, a very exciting uh, regime that uh, in uh, five to ten years will be within reach of the highest intensity intensity lasers. Again, as I as I've mentioned, much of the physics that uh, we are exploring here is also uh, present uh, when looking at colliders, and this this has, has brought very nice very nice interactions and. Uh, and so the the standard configuration of, uh, for instance, electron positron collider is also can be also a source of conditions where this chi parameter can be quite high, and just by examining the oscillation of an electron beam on an ion channel where where the laser again is driven this way, can we have an electron beam here? There are also conditions where this chi parameter the, that uh, that tells us if we are close to the quantum regime or not can be can be reached these values of point 0.1 and 1. So there's a nice confluence here of the possibility of doing uh, experiments with lasers and the experiments with intense beams that are putting us just just on the brink of this exciting on this exciting regime associated with these extreme physics. Um, on colliding beams the physics is even more complex uh, and this is uh, when we collide an electron beam with a positron beam we have several different regimes this is what we call the low disruption regime and this is what is present on accelerators but if we go to uh, this transition regime where there are several pinches of of the of the beam as it goes uh, as the beams go through itself they, then it's becoming even more exciting and the chi parameters become uh, the chi can become even more uh, sophisticated. I'm showing this because this is one possible direction of uh, laser wake field acceleration. Is when we start to generate electron beams and possible positron beams with very high energies, we can actually have our laser-driven collider to study all these exciting uh, nonlinear physics that sometimes is not possible to study on a conventional accelerator. If we think that we can push this even to higher chi's, uh, we can reach even more exciting regimes. Uh, unfortunately, with lasers, this is very it's very hard to to achieve. But if we collide two electron beams and these beams are are very high charge, very high energy, very narrowly uh, focused, it's possible to reach regimes such that the chi uh this uh this chi parameter uh verifies this this condition here and this is exciting in terms in terms of physics so alpha is the fine structure constant so the, this essentially tells us chi to the two-thirds is over is larger than one over uh, one alpha and the and and uh, several scientists have conjectured that this is the transition where qed becomes a strongly coupled theory instead of uh, uh, and so it's no longer possible to do standard perturbation uh, standard perturbation theory this is quite 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 exciting uh, uh, 
theoretical theoretical results indicate that uh, um, the changes to the existing theory are not significant but nevertheless it's important to find uh, uh, experimental configurations to explore these we have worked on the beam beam collisions but other other authors have also explored electron beam laser configurations just to show you that there is a there is a, a unity here you know, on these uh, on these different different regimes that is quite uh, quite uh, quite exciting. Um, of course, one, one can question how much of uh, I, I started to talk about extreme plasma physics. How much plasma physics are is present on these uh, on these on these conditions for the experiments that have people people have done up to now. Uh, we are still far from saying that we are in conditions where uh, plasma physics is a collective effects are playing a role because for that to be possible we need to generate a density of electrons and positrons that we are still far from uh, from having uh, from having achieved nevertheless there are clear uh, configurations where qed can be important for instance when we shine a very intense laser into a solid target uh, uh, qed needs to be taken into account when we are generating, uh, when we are shining two lasers at the, again at a very dense target, there might be indications there of QED effects. And we are when we are looking at high harmonic generation, also with uh, with very intense fields, there are corrections that we know that will show up on the spectrum due to QED effects due to the generation of electrons and positrons. So this is very exciting physics. We are not yet at the stage where. Uh, collective plasma effects are playing a role, but there are several indications that we'll be able to observe QED effects in some of these some of these scenarios. Finally, to conclude, let me just uh, point out uh, uh, two particular scenarios where these processes are of of importance, and there is an inter there there is something to learn on the laser side that can be of relevance for uh, for uh, astrophysics. And this is the study of the magnetospheres of neutron stars and pulsars. What is interesting is that in, in pulsars, these fast uh, rotating uh, neutron stars, stars that, uh, that are uh, at the end of the, the evolution of a star, so a star collapses and uh, it either collapses into a, a black hole or into a neutron star, and uh, these stars are very strong magnetic fields they are fastly rotating and if we examine the, the magnetosphere we'll see that the field intensities are so high that qed effects can can play a role so there are a number of groups that are using numerical tools very similar to the ones that uh, many scientists are using for lasers to understand what's happening in these objects why these objects are radiating uh, how particles are accelerated in these structures so this is a very exciting very exciting direction so there are lots of work for instance looking at magnetic reconnection so how the magnetic field lines are modified uh, for instance in the equatorial plane of these objects uh, scientists looking at uh, the global evolution of this uh, of these minimum mini uh, these magnetospheres and also scientists looking at the particular details of what is happening on near the polar cap of uh, these neutron stars what is exciting here is that some of the physics not all but some of the physics uh, that we can learn here is also of relevance for these high intensity lasers and vice versa and uh, in uh, in my team we've been trying to use some of the tools that we use for high intensity lasers also in this context to try to understand uh, what is common in QED cascades, for instance, the laboratory driven by lasers with QED cascades driven by beams and uh, QED cascades present in these, in these objects. So these are very exciting, very exciting frontiers in extreme physics. There are several open questions in fundamental QED processing intense fields. And uh, we've been expressing and benchmarking these processes with, in plasma kinetic codes uh many many scientists have been optimizing configurations for secondary sources of gamma rays and positrons and of course there is the, there are uh, radiation signatures for all these processes uh, either in laboratory and in astrophysics that is important to understand if you want to understand a little bit uh, deeper uh, the fundamental uh, processes in 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 extreme physics 
One point that I didn't mention is that in several of these scenarios, and most notably when we are talking about neutron stars or the magnetospheres of black holes, coupling with general relativity becomes important. And so this is another another exciting frontier in, in extreme physics. And with this, I would like to, to, to finish my talk. And again, thank you very much for, for, for the invitation. And it's a, it's a pleasure to celebrate with you this important, uh, this important anniversary. So thank you. Thank you very much.